Welcome back to our next lesson, Grade 10 Chemistry, where we've been talking about reactions of redox reactions, the reactions of metals, and how we gain and lose electrons between them, predict what goes on. Today's task is around looking at a practical activity. For those following at home, that's okay. We have some work to help you do it if you don't have the materials at home. Let's hope you don't feel like this lady here when you do your uh, redox reactions. So what we're looking at today, we're going to do the experiment. Compare the reactivity of metals based on experimental results. So instantly you should be thinking, if I'm looking at reactivity, I would probably need that reactivity series or activity series that we spoke about last time. This was all based on redox reactions. Remember where they came from? Reduction, oxidation. And we'll look at how it's the transfer of electrons in displacement reactions. What do I actually mean? Because I didn't explain a lot about that last time. Right, before we go on, quick task for you to have a go at. Write the electron configuration for sodium, magnesium, and aluminium. Now, with these, we're going to have a look at the electrons in the outer shell and look at the group number of each metal. The easiest way to do that is to go back to your copy of the periodic table. There's one saved in the OneDrive that I've given you guys. There's also um, heaps of them online if you just Google periodic table. You need it to help yourself do this. So there's one there for you. So sodium is Na, and that is that one right there, Na, in the first group. Now, if you recall, um, atoms in the first column or the first group, they're group one because they have one valence electron. So how do we know that? Notice on sodium on the periodic table right there, its atomic number is 11, which means it has 11 protons, which means it has 11 electrons as well, because the protons are the positive charge, the electrons are the negative charge. So if we have 11 electrons to distribute in the shells, remember we have an atom of sodium. The first shell has two. The next one has eight. One two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Notice the first shell, I drew the two X's to represent the electrons opposite each other. It's kind of like the negative charges, so they're repelling each other. However, in the next uh, energy level, the second one there, where I drew the, the next eight, I put them in pairs, but in opposite sides. They like to exist in pairs, it's just how chemists like to draw it. There's a lot of complex physics to explain why that occurs. But let's just run with it for now. So if I do eight in the second level and two in the first level, that means I have 10, but I've got to get to 11. So I need another energy level. And number 11 goes out there on his own. You can think of number 11, this one sitting there way out on its own, away from everybody else. It's very easy to lose that one. If sodium loses that particular one, then the last energy level of electrons it has is that one there that I just indicated, which is full because eight is a full energy level. Hence, it is a more stable way for sodium to operate. Losing that electron will mean that sodium has a positive charge, and that is more stable for sodium to behave that way, to keep that positive charge, than it is to have the extra electron and be electrically neutral. The next one to do is magnesium. Magnesium is number 12 on the periodic table there. So if I try to do magnesium, I'll just use this one here. Magnesium has 12, two in the first level, eight in the next level, that's 10. So I'll need another one in that last energy level, two electrons there. So you can see that magnesium will lose those last two electrons both of those and become magnesium 2 plus and aluminium very similar with aluminium al aluminium is the next one in the periodic table it has a point number 13 so we need 13 protons we need 13 electrons we have two in our first level, 
eight in the next level, and we need another three because two plus eight plus three makes the thirteen. So we just chuck another one there. So that means there's three in the outer level, those two and that one. You can lose those three and become AL3+. plus. Notice what we've done when we've done this. Group one had one valence electron or one electron in its outer layer. Group two had two, that was the magnesium. So he became two plus. And it's 13 at the top there because we've numbered all these through here, but if we ignore the 10 in the middle there, that becomes group three. Three valence electrons becomes a three plus charge. That's why Mendeleev ended up arranging things this way, and that's why it works so well, and we still use it to this day. All right, so a little bit more about reactivity of metals. When metal atoms react, they lose electrons from the outer shell. However, not all metals lose electrons in a chemical reaction with the same reactivity. And that's the activity series that we spoke about last time. Some do it easier than others. So today's lesson, we'll look at an experiment results from a, uh, some practical activities to compare the reactivity of different metals. You should, if you have got some gear like that in the science laboratory, that's great. This is this bluey greeny liquid is the copper sulfate, a piece of zinc, a piece of magnesium, and a piece of copper, and we mix them together. So, don't forget safety equipment. If you're doing this at home and you have this equipment, you can do it in like an ice cube tray or something like that, or little milk bottle lids or whatever. Okay, if you're doing it in a science lab, you'll have a proper spotting tray, which is usually looks like a little sort of tile and then has these little indents in it like this. There was a picture of one on the last uh, diagram, one on the last uh, video that we did. And they're nice little trays because the hole in it, the tray is usually sort of no bigger than about that. And it usually isn't much deeper than what I've shown there. So you can just put a small sample of your liquid into that little hole there. So that, this hole here is looking at this one from above. That's the way I've drawn it. There is a handout that I've put in the OneDrive for you to um, help yourself through this um, particular experiment. Here's the picture again. Here's your spotting tray. You put a tiny sample of copper sulfate in each of these little wells, or use your milk bottle lids or an ice cube tray if you're at home. Then you put a piece of copper in one, magnesium one, and zinc in the other one, and you watch what happens. You record what goes on on the sheet that I referred to in the OneDrive on the last slide. Here's the uh, results table that you should have, and you write your observations in there. Now if we think about it, it all goes comes back to the reactivity series. Copper metal and copper ions, they are the same level on the reactivity series, so they're not really going to react. So really, in this that particular one, should be nothing. Nothing happened, no equation, no equation. But the magnesium and zinc will be a little bit different. I'll come back to that in a minute. If you're at home, you can check out these videos here, which give you an idea of what's going on. In my diagram on the left here, copper sulfate solution and a magnesium strip goes into it. We end up with the copper sulfate looks a bit more pale and we get a brown solution there. Or well, there's another way of looking at it. See, it's sort of more blue there and a more pale solution there. And, and what you can actually see here is the reaction occurring where it starts to sort of fizz up a little bit and you start to get the uh, copper forming on the actual magnesium. That's the brown solid. And the magnesium will go into solution. The zinc and copper reaction is this one here. I do highly recommend you go and check these videos out to actually see the reaction if you're following from home. But what you end up with is a similar sort of thing. You end up with copper solid forming on the um, strip and the copper sulfate solution goes a little bit more pale. So the brown solid is copper in both situations. So, come back to our results table, what should we see? Nothing for the first one. Magnesium is there on, a, on the reactivity series and copper is down there. So what do we see? We see the copper solution. Copper solution goes pale. And we see a brown solid on 
metal. In this one, you will see the same thing. Zinc is there a little bit lower on the reactivity series. Because the magnesium is higher, you would expect it to react quicker, a bit more vigorously. You would probably expect to see a little bit more of the solid copper formed because it's going to react quicker than you would with the zinc because the zinc is slightly lower on the reactivity series, hence it's slightly less reactive. Our equations, well, they come from our nice little table here. We have Mg solid gives Mg aqueous 2 plus because it told me that there. If it's 2 plus, there must be two electrons. So the copper does the reverse reaction. We'll go that way. Copper aqueous, and it starts off as 2 plus because it told me that there. Plus the two electrons from above, so E minus for electron, gives copper solid. Stable copper solid, and that's the brown stuff that you see. You should be able to do the same reaction now in here for the zinc because you have the zinc reaction there and the copper reaction is exactly the same. You can combine these two half reactions together to form the entire reaction. Put your reactants together, put your products together, leave out the electrons. All right, a little bit of textbook work that you can do. Have a look at these three pages of your book to have a look a bit more about displaced metals, transferring electrons, and displacement of silver. And this is the displacement part we're talking about. In that last experiment that we just discussed, the displacement bit was we were displacing, for example, magnesium ions or atoms off the solid magnesium strip and making them go into solution. It was being displaced by the solid copper that was forming on the magnesium strip as it reacted. Right, a few questions for you to go. Define a redox reaction and a displacement reaction. Displacement means we are displacing one atom with another, and in a redox reaction, it is a solid metal that is reacting and going into solution, being displaced by a metal that's in solution that becomes a solid. The redox part means one atom will be oxidized or lose electrons and go into solution. The other one is reduced or gain electrons and become the solid. Question two, magnesium reacts with zinc nitrate. Complete the word equation. Now, the zinc nitrate bit means that the zinc bit is the bit in solution. So what we, uh, what we need to know here is zinc is there on the activity series. Magnesium is the metal. It is higher, so it's going to react. So we're going to end up with magnesium nitrate plus zinc metal. All we did was we displaced it because the nitrate went over to the magnesium part. Magnesium nitrate and zinc metal. So which metal loses its electrons? Magnesium's higher, so he's going to lose them. He's oxidized. Hence the zinc is reduced. It gains the electrons. Question three. Consider these reactions, copper sulfate plus zinc metal and zinc sulfate plus copper metal. Any one of these will recur, which one and why? Once again, we come back to our activity series. Copper's here, that one there, and zinc is there. Because zinc is higher on the activity series, it has to be the metal ion that is oxidized and becomes aqueous in the solution. Hence. The copper has to start as an ion and become the solid metal that's deposited in the reaction. So the only way to make that work is to start with the copper sulfate one and start with the zinc metal. That's that one there. This reaction will not occur because the zinc is higher on the reactivity series. All right, a little bit we've done today. Might need to go back to do those textbook work. Make sure you've watched those videos. Have a think about it. And next time we'll have a little bit more at the periodic table, predict a bit more about ions and how we gain and lose those valence electrons. Um, write some simple formulas and extend the activity a bit further with some more ionic formula. 
and there's some textbook pages. I recommend you go and check those out before next lesson. Thanks for coming.